The internet is full of fan theories that give alternate explanations to plot lines and endings of movies, series, games, cartoons, and virtually every conceivable media out there. But some strange theories are a little darker than others, suggesting a more twisted view of the characters that we have grown accustomed to. Lenoria is an abandoned town in the middle of the Atacama Desert located in Chile. It's known these days as having one of the most haunted cemeteries in the world, as many of the bodies found here have started to unearth themselves, with skeletons protruding from the ground. Many of those who live nearby say that the bodies of the dead rise at nightfall and can be seen wandering around. The following clip explores these allegations and takes a brief look at the city of La Noria. So some of the coffins have been fully exhumed, you can see here. Okay guys, so really quick before we lose sun, I wanted to cover the ghostly legend of the La Noria Cemetery. So as you've probably seen, a lot of the bodies here have been disturbed. That is from people looting, grave robbers, and just vandals, I think. So you've probably seen a few exposed bodies. Now, supposedly this has left spirits a little bit disgruntled, a bit angry, and at night, when the sun comes down, they rise from their graves and walk over to the town of Lernoria. So I'm gonna wait for the sun to go down and see if that legend is true, see if I can encounter a form of zombie ghost. Hoibashi Forest is home to some really strange phenomena. There have been multiple UFO sightings in the area, ghost sightings, disembodied voices, and even reports of strange, unexplainable types of vegetation growing. In the following clip, YouTuber Amy's Crypt takes a look at some of these allegations and explores the forest at night, hoping to catch some sort of evidence of paranormal activity. Animal, surely. That has to be a deer or something. Okay, so out here, a lot of apparitions have been seen that look as if they are people, but they're made of black shadow. Um, there's also common reports. There's definitely something walking in there. Yeah. Must be a deer, right? But as I was saying, a lot of people have experienced and reported suddenly forming black mist just out of nowhere. And that usually coincides with apparition sightings as well. So I haven't seen anything similar to that or experienced anything like that, but I can totally just imagine it happening out here. Because particularly at night when it is this dark, it is very creepy.
The accurately named Chillingham Palace in England is known as being one of the most haunted buildings in the country. The list of ghost sightings and apparitions could go on for days, as many of the people who resided in this palace are believed to have been tortured. Because of this, some say that the restless souls of those who passed away in the building have been wandering aimlessly for decades. Amy's Crypt documented a spirit box providing all sorts of strange, concerning responses at the palace. Take a look at an exploration of this allegedly haunted building. Now I'm about to do a spirit box inside Chillingham Castle's dungeon. Hello, my name is Amy. Are there any spirits around that wish to communicate? Stop. Can you come close and tell me your name? Why were you locked in the dungeon here? Who is it that tortured you? The Cathedral House Hotel, located in Scotland, is believed to have been built around the year 1887. It's considered one of the most haunted places in Scotland, located immediately across the street from the Glasgow Necropolis. The building is known to have been closely connected with a nearby prison, though this prison has now been demolished. Amy's Crypt decided to head to the hotel and spend a full night there, documenting any sort of potential paranormal activity that she found. In one instance, Amy's seen filming a series of toilets flushing seemingly on their own, without any sort of human interaction. So, maybe you should go in there because that's the dude's toilet. We were sitting upstairs, there's no one else downstairs here at all that we know of, and we're hearing the toilets flush down here in the bar area. Sounds like water's running in there now too. I can check it out. Yeah, you go in there first and catch this. So the urinal like filling up as if it has been flushing? So you think it's been flushed? Do they auto do that every now and then? Yeah, let me check. Doesn't look automatic to me. Yeah. Or it's sleeping. Maybe. Hold on. You shouldn't be in here. Ah, let's get the f*** out of here. Oh! 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 I think I just walked in on a ghost taking a leak. <laughs> um, I don't know if they're on some kind of auto sensor. I didn't see one in there though, and it looked pretty, it looked like an older one. Yeah. Yeah, I, again, I don't know if they're in an auto center or what, but that thing has been flushing by itself. This final clip comes from the Ancient Ram Inn, which has gained popularity recently due to its extremely dark history, ghost stories, and even documented demonic activity. It's widely assumed to be haunted, and in an episode of Amy's Crib, she witnesses her temperature gauge intermittently rating 666. Right now, guys, I'm in what is known as the Witch's Room, supposed to be haunted uh, by a woman, also her black cat, so I'm very excited about that one. Um, apparently she doesn't like the term witch, uh, so I might hang out in here and uh, see if I can set off any 
of these uh, temperature gauges I've got set up behind me. I wonder if I can maybe communicate with this torch. Is there anybody in this room with me? Can you make a noise? Can you affect this torch behind me? Or this temperature gauge? Are you there? I heard you have a cat. So something to note. Ooh. Are you making that number on purpose? Is there someone in the back corner of this room? I can hear scratching coming from the back of the room. All right, so not 666 anymore, but what I wanted to show you is the difference in this temperature gauge here and this one on the floor. This one here reads 69. This one here is much lower, so 66.7. I don't know if that's normal. Could this strange light anomaly be paranormal, dust, or a bug? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. This one's staying pretty steady. This one here is fluctuating a bit. So this has gone way back up now. So that temperature gauge is going up here, uh, which is different to what it has been. Uh, right behind me is the window, uh, which is sort of at street level, and people have seen and taken photos of a woman peering out of that window. On the night of September 6th, 1987, Playboy's satellite network was airing a film titled Three Daughters. As viewers were enjoying the film, a broadcast signal intrusion occurred that completely took over the channel. A text-only message popped up on screen that said, Thus saith the Lord thy God, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Obviously the takeover was done by a religious person who did not agree with the content being aired. While it's fair to agree with this outlook, it may be considered that many viewers were on a pay-per-view basis meaning that the broadcast turned into a waste of money for the audience. Furthermore, despite the message being shared, it's illegal to intrude on a live signal. Thomas Haney was an uplink engineer at the Christian Broadcasting Network, which is a television ministry. Haney was working at the time of the hack. That and other evidence labeled Haney as a prime suspect. The religious message in the type of equipment used led police to the religious network. VHS recording of the broadcast left subtle technical clues for investigators and ultimately was enough to incriminate CBN as the source. Investigators tried to recreate the hack using similar technology but were unsuccessful, making the trial much harder. Throughout the trial and even following it, CBN stood by their innocence and referred to the prosecution's evidence as circumstantial and weak. The jury finally sided with prosecution and found Haney guilty of at least two counts of signal piracy. They also revealed that Haney was responsible for at least four other hacks that resembled the Playboy incident. He was sentenced to three years of probation, a $1,000 fine, and 150 hours of community service. While the signal intrusion may not seem scary, it's very much disturbing due to the simple fact that it demonstrates how easily hackers can take over what's supposed to be a private broadcast signal. Yeah, the best of it, but uh, we're going to be looking for a bigger Tell us the... I know that uh, she wants... Steve Wilkos is a daytime TV personality that takes on cases similar to The Jerry Springer Show or Mari. The Steve Wilkos Show is owned by WGN and aired all over the country on most analog channels. The show attracts a large audience demographic and provides daytime viewers to get lost in the drama and entertainment of the show. Most viewers never would have suspected this eerie and sudden interruption though. 
During a 2013 episode of the show, Steve had special guests that were teens in serious relationships. A teen couple were arguing passionately back and forth as Steve attempted to mediate. Just in the midst of the dispute, a disturbing and loud tone of the emergency alert system began to play over the show's audio. As is typical with an emergency alert, the various tones and a warning screen were played. Eventually, a voice started to speak to the audience. The voice was deep and extremely distorted with white noise and effects. The voice warned the audience, allegedly as part of the alert system, claiming, The following messages on screen will be updated as more information becomes available. Do not attempt to approach or apprehend these bodies, as they are considered extremely dangerous. Looking at it now, it probably seems like nothing to worry about, as there's no way a zombie attack could have happened. However, considering the edit of the alert and the trust that citizens have in safety officials, massive crowds of people were concerned. Montana was one of the specific places where the interruption occurred, and the Montana police recount numerous calls coming in from all over the state to inquire about the alleged attack. Officers were eventually able to get information out of the public to reassure their safety. CBS, the parent station to WGN, released a statement describing the situation and what precautions were taken to resolve the issue. The president of CBS also stated that other local broadcast stations across the country were almost hijacked as well, thanks to failed attempts on the suspect's behalf. The truly terrifying aspect of this case is that if officials were not able to get out the truth in time, some viewers may have taken the warning too seriously and acted out, harming others or themselves. Luckily, no incidents followed as a result of the hack, and overall, it was just creepy to know that such serious threats can be easily issued to the public. Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. Follow the messages on screen that will be updated as information becomes available. Do not attempt to approach or apprehend these bodies as they are considered extremely deep. Clearly, some broadcast interruptions are nothing too severe. Most of the time, it's just an edgy hacker trying to spook the audience or occasionally someone wanting to spread their own ideals. As for spreading ideals, the example fits perfectly, as this clip shows propaganda during a war. It also shows the more serious side of networks being hijacked while on air. Hezbollah is an Islamic political party and militant group in Lebanon. During the 2016 Lebanon War, a broadcast channel owned and controlled by Hezbollah known as Al Manar TV was hacked by an unknown member of the opposite Israeli political group. The person came on air to show anti-Hezbollah propaganda explain the disagreements between the two groups, and even make threats. At one point, Hezbollah's leader was shown on screen in a grainy video taken from a public event. The image was edited to show the crosshairs fill the frame and cover the leader's face as to emulate that he would soon be shot. The image played on screen for a second, but was then followed by three gunshots and the speaker saying, Your day is coming. The propaganda video that followed showed images of deceased soldiers with quotes written out across the bottom of the screen. The messages related to war combat and political ideals of Hezbollah at that time. Obviously, they passionately disagreed. A truly threatening hack like this makes less severe broadcast interruptions in the rest of the world a little scary. However, it gives yet another reason for networks and private satellite broadcasts to improve on their equipment and safety protocols. <laughs> On April 27, 1986, HBO was airing the movie The Falcon and the Snowman when it was interrupted by a signal hacker. The signal was lost momentarily, just as it can be during emergency alerts or technical difficulties. There is nothing of the sort though. Instead, a man named John R. McDougall was to blame for the suddenly failed signal. After a few seconds, John successfully jammed the signal and was able to air his message. 
Working under the pseudonym Captain Midnight, John shared his desired broadcast for almost five minutes while the stations responsible for regularly scheduled programming frantically fought to remove John from the signal. The message displayed by Captain Midnight is almost comical, as it surrounds such a casual issue. John, though, felt passionately enough about the issue to risk signal piracy charges. In front of a technical display screen, white text simply read, Good evening, HBO. From Captain Midnight, $12.99 a month, no way. Clearly, John was deeply upset by the quickly rising cost of satellite cable subscriptions such as HBO, and wanted to hack the signal as an act of protest in place of an idea agreed upon by many viewers. Unfortunately, despite how his message may seem harmless or even humorous, piracy is a serious crime. As a result of this incident, John was arrested and charged with signal piracy. Under an agreement with the prosecutor, he plea bargained and received a $5,000 fine, one year unsupervised probation, and his amateur radio license was suspended for a year. This intrusion gained a significant amount of attention and controversy when it happened. Many Americans feared that if a single man can hack a channel just to complain about rising bills, it meant that someone more dangerous could also gain that same control. These type of signal intrusions are a threat that must be carefully considered in a case of wartime. One executive deemed the crime video terrorism, and efforts grew even stronger to try to protect the signals. On November 26, 1977, a news broadcast of nothing special was being aired around 5.10 p.m. As the news anchor read out its current story, the video became grainy and distorted. Finally, a male voice began to speak. In this case, the hacker was posing as an extraterrestrial life form wanting to communicate with Earthlings. The anonymous hacker called himself Vrilla and claimed to be from an intergalactic association. Despite his English accent, Vrillon gained some points for using impressive video editing skills to disguise his voice. Vrillon stated that he'd spoken to humans before hijacking the station out of respect, but could no longer sit by and watch Earth destroy itself. Vrillon controlled the signal for over six minutes, in which time he provided details about his opinions and his demands. He detailed that Earthlings needed to stop their destructive path of pollution, and more as it was harmful for the planet. He instructed that it was time to put away weapons as the time for war has passed. Vrillon continued to state that a new age of Aquarius was beginning and if viewers did not heed his warnings and release themselves of guns and false idols, severe consequences would follow. Allegedly, the human species would not make it to the next stage of evolution or even life. While you may see this message as encouraging, it was certainly shared in a threatening manner. Additionally, the hijacking incident was one of the first ever to occur, paving the way for other dangerous hackers. He's stopping the execution of all captured prisoners of war. In Australia, Mr. K. Packer's cricketers are still pleased to buy this big high court decision. It's the man of the play test match. This is the voice of Grimmar, representative of the Ashtar Galactic Commander, speaking to you. For many years, you have seen us as knights and scoundrels. We speak to you now, and we say the same as we have done to your brothers and sisters all over this, your planet Earth. Bob Lazar claimed to have worked at Area 51 in the 1980s. Bob Lazar claimed from 1988 to 1989 he worked at a base on the Area 51 complex known as S4. He claimed the base was carved into a mountain range. 
While inside the base, he claimed he saw a flying disc type UFO which had an American flag imprinted on it. Once he saw this, he believed the reports of UFOs may have simply been this type of technology which the public is unaware of. He claimed it was his task to reverse engineer the UFO. By doing this, he stated that he found the craft used propelled gravity generators and was fueled by Element 115. Element 115 was not confirmed to have existed or been discovered until 2013. However, Bob Lazar spoke about the element 24 years before its discovery. He claimed there were nine of the UFO spacecraft at Area 51 in 1989. He claimed to have seen documents which stated that the UFOs which he was back engineering originally came from the Zeta Reticuli star system. In the UFO community, the Zeta Reticuli star system is said to be home to the Zeta Reticuli. These have also become known as the Greys. The Greys are the most reported aliens in alien abduction cases. People such as Barney and Betty Hill have reported to have been abducted by them. <laughs> The greys are said to be interdimensional entities which exist two overtones above the major overtone our third dimension exists in. This would mean they would exist in the lower overtones of the fourth dimension somewhere in between the third and fourth making them interdimensional entities. After coming across this information Bob Lazar couldn't help but blab about it to his friends. As he worked there he knew the schedule for when they would test fly the crafts. In March of 1989 Lazar and a few friends went to a vantage point where the test flight could be seen. They took a video camera with them and captured footage of one of the UFOs in flight at Area 51. As the footage was captured in the 1980s, the quality isn't the greatest. The video shows a glowing ball of light making strange movements in the sky. This next footage was captured in 1992 by William Cooper. William Cooper was a former US Naval Intelligence officer who then became a public speaker and documentary filmmaker. He documented many conspiracy theories including UFOs and aliens. In 1992, he made a documentary called Project Red Light. For the documentary, he visited Area 51 and recorded test flights of the secret technology they have. While making the documentary, he captured footage of two different types of secret spacecrafts which resembled UFOs. The first craft, which was caught on tape 27 years ago, shows a glowing object in the sky which makes some really strange movements. The craft looks like a glowing ball similar to the same craft Bob Lazar filmed. In the documentary, William Cooper stated that he wasn't sure if the object itself was glowing or if it was ionizing the air around it, causing a glowing effect. William Cooper claimed the crafts were taken off from a hangar located at Groom Lake. This next video was captured on the 12th of April 2016. Steve Barone caught some bizarre lights over Area 51 from the foothills of Red Rock Canyon. There is very little information surrounding the clip. Steve went to Area 51 at night to see if he would be able to capture anything of an alien nature on tape. He claimed to have been waiting for an hour with no activity taking place when suddenly the lights appeared in the sky. After the footage was put up on the internet, UFO enthusiasts claimed that it was proof of alien technology being used at Area 51. The sighting may simply be military flares. The footage looks very similar to the Phoenix Lights incident. The Phoenix Lights incidents were a series of widely sighted unidentified flying objects observed in the skies over the United States states of Arizona, Nevada and the Mexican state of Sonora. It happened on March 13, 1997. The original sightings of the UFO has never been caught on tape, however a second set of stationary lights which were military flares had been caught on tape. If you compare the footage to the sighting captured at Area 51, they look very similar. So this sighting may have simply been flares rather than alien technology. However, it may also be the boomerang craft which will be shown later. This next sighting was caught on tape in February of 2019. It was uploaded onto YouTube on February 28th, 2019. The YouTuber who uploaded it goes by the name of Adventures with Christian. He claimed during the night time he got as close to the main gate of Area 51 as he could. He stayed there until something appeared in the sky. He captured a gleaming white object in the sky which looks identical to the videos captured by Bob Lazar and William Cooper. The YouTuber claimed the flying object was doing things that a conventional jet or helicopter couldn't do. If the object was the same object captured by Bob Lazar and William Cooper, then this would mean that they are still using alleged reverse engineered alien technology which they have been tinkering with for the past 30 years.
This next footage once again comes from the 1992 documentary Project Red Light by William Cooper. Towards the end of the documentary, on one of his last nights watching Area 51, William Cooper captured the test flight of a really advanced craft which flew directly over him. He claimed the craft was a wing-type V-shape which has also become known as boomerang UFOs. The boomerang UFOs have been being reported since the 1980s. One of the first official reported sightings of the boomerang UFO occurred in Hudson Valley of the United States. On the 31st of December 1981, residents of Hudson Valley reported seeing a boomerang V-shaped craft in the sky. The sightings continued throughout until 1987. The most well-known sighting of the boomerang UFO was a 1997 Phoenix Lights incident listed earlier. William Cooper captured the super secret boomerang UFO technology on tape taking off from Area 51. He claimed the craft flew directly above him and made no sound. He claimed to be so overwhelmed when seeing it, he didn't think of detaching the camera from the tripod to get a better look. This case became one of the most famous hauntings in the UK. It became known as the Brown Lady. The case has become so popular that it's got its own Wikipedia entry. The haunting is said to take place in Raynham Hall, Norfolk, England. The name being the Brown Lady came from witness reports of the ghost reportedly wearing a brown brocade dress. The legend claims that the ghost is Lady Dorothy Warpole. She was a sister of Robert Walpole, who has been considered the first Prime Minister of Great Britain. The lady was the second wife of Charles Townsend. He was known for having a violent temper. One day he found out that she was cheating on him. He then locked her in different rooms of the hall and wouldn't let her leave. She wasn't even allowed to leave to see her children. She was never allowed to leave the house again and she stayed locked inside until she died of smallpox in 1726. So it's believed she is the lady ghost which haunts the place. Sightings there have spanned back over two centuries. For example, during the Christmas time of 1835, many sightings occurred. A witness who saw the ghost said it had empty eye sockets and a glowing face. Many of the staff who were employed at the hall had to quit after having an encounter with the ghost. Over time, there have been loads of sightings of the ghost and it has also been caught on camera. A man by the name of Captain Hubert Provand was a London-based photographer who worked for Country Life magazine. For his job, he went to the hall and took photographs for an article which he was writing. While there, he claims to have captured a photo of the ghost. After the photo was published, people argue that the sighting was a case of double exposure. This next case comes from the town of Ipswich in Suffolk, England. Back in March of 1959, a woman by the name of Miss Mabel Chinnery went with her husband to a local graveyard. Her husband's mother was buried at the graveyard just a week earlier, so they went to visit the grave. Once it was time to leave, Miss Mabel took a photo of her husband sitting in their car. After they got the photos developed and took a look at them, they realized something strange was sitting in the back seat. They realized there was a figure appearing in the back seat. During the time the picture was taken, only her husband was in the car. The couple believed the spirit which appeared in the photograph was the late mother of the husband. In my opinion, it looks more like a male than a female. Miss Mabel said that the ghost was sitting in the same seat her husband's late mother would sit whenever they would take her out. Considering they were in a graveyard, there may have been many locked-ins hanging about. A month later, the couple had the photo published in an English newspaper called Sunday Pictorial. After the photo was released to the press, an expert came forward to claim that the picture could not be a result of double exposure as it would be very noticeable. So who knows if they actually captured a ghost on camera. This next case comes from New York. Back in 1988, a 58-year-old woman by the name of Rose Bevento was involved in a car crash. She was traveling down the roads of Pauling, New York. She then almost hit a stray dog in the road. She swerved out the road and completely totaled the car. The crash destroyed the car, but somehow Rose escaped uninjured. The emergency services arrived and were shocked to find Rose safe and sound. The Pauling Fire Department took pictures of the wreckage. Once they got the pictures back, they noticed that they caught something on camera. Next to the wreckage, something appears which looks pale white and translucent. The firefighters analyzed the pictures and got the negatives. They showed that the figure could still be seen. After Rose saw the photo, she claimed that she believed it was an angel which saved her from being hurt during the crash. This next case comes from London. In London, there is a place called the National Maritime Museum. The place is graded as an ancient monument. The museum has some history behind it. Back in 1635, it housed Anne of Denmark. This was the Queen of King James I. There is a place there known as the Queen's House. 
Back in 1966, Reverend Ralph Hardy visited the Queen's house. While there, he was taking photographs. He took a photo of a staircase called the Tulip Staircase. Once he got the photos developed, he showed them to a friend. His friend then went on to ask him who he was taking a photo of. When he looked at the photo, he was shocked to find something appearing at the bottom which looks like it's holding on to the bottom of the staircase. While taking the photo, there was no one there. The photo was later analyzed by experts, including people at Kodak. They concluded that the photograph was genuine and had not been tampered with. This next case has become one of the scariest hauntings in America. Back in 1974, some guy called Ronald DeFeo Jr. went crazy and murdered his entire family. This included his parents and four siblings, the youngest one being nine years old. Ronald DeFeo Jr. woke up in his basement at 3.15 a.m. He claimed to be hearing voices. The voices he claimed were of his family conspiring to kill him. He claims a black-handed hooded demon then gave him a rifle which he murdered his family with. His family was sleeping when he carried out the crimes. After the police arrived and the investigation started, he claimed the house was haunted which drove him to killing everyone. He also claimed to be possessed. A year went by and the house was sold to a family. The Lutz family moved in but they only lasted 28 days. They then ran out of the house screaming. They didn't take anything with them and claimed something paranormal was the cause. Because of the house's history, several paranormal investigations were carried out. Ed and Lorraine Warren, who are famous for their investigations, went to the house to see what was going on. A seance was carried out and also cameras set on self-timers were placed around the house. While the cameras were active, they caught a photo of a little boy in the house. During the time, there were no children in the house. It had been vacant for months. The boy resembles the youngest child, John Matthew DeFeo. After the investigation, the Lutz family showed the photo to their youngest daughter and she told them, that's the boy I used to play with. Also, whenever a pregnant secretary saw the photo, her baby would kick. This wasn't the only creepy thing to happen during the investigation. Ed Warren described getting stabbing chest pains, hearing crying, and seeing hooded figures which resembled monks. Ed also claimed that when he went down to the basement, he became overwhelmed with a feeling, claiming a legion of demons were present. Lorraine said that she could feel that there were evil spirits in the home which she claimed came from the bowels of the earth. So maybe they caught John Matthew DeFeo's ghost on camera. Lorraine Warren claimed it was probably a demon masquerading as John Matthew DeFeo to feed off people's energy when scaring them. 26-year-old trained chef Jamie Herdman from New Zealand was working for a furniture removal company in Western Australia when he decided to go on a road trip. He'd spent a while working on a Nissan utility van, which he intended to drive around Australia. He was reported missing by his family on the 5th of December, 2006, after he'd not been in contact with them as expected. Police launched an investigation and found that he was last seen trying to hitch a ride at Daily Waters, around 370 miles from Darwin, where his family believed he was headed. His van, which was prone to overheating, was found abandoned near a Stewart Highway roadhouse. Inside, police found his clothes, cell phone, toothbrush, credit cards, and some cash. It was unlocked, but the keys were nowhere to be found. The route that he chose to take to Daily Waters through the middle of Australia in November of 2006 is described by his brother, Carl, as bizarre. Since Jamie is a keen fisherman, and his family thought that it would have been far more likely for him to travel along the coast. Jamie didn't inform his friends, family, or workplace that he was leaving, and his brother said that he left Broome in a hurry. They believe that he may have been told by a friend that someone was after him. His family was holding out hope that he was oblivious to the fact that people were searching for him, as he may have become stranded in a remote Aboriginal community which was cut off by heavy flooding in the area. But as time passed, it became ever more unlikely that he would be found alive. Despite launching an extensive search on land and in the air, police have come up empty-handed and have found no further clues into Jamie's disappearance. To this day, he remains one of the many missing people who have never been found after traveling through the remote outback of Australia. Joshua Jones, a 25-year-old man from Hurst Rise, UK, left his home at 11.30 a.m. on the 12th of December, 2020, to 
telling his wife, Talia, that he was going to the pharmacy and that he would be back soon. He put on his coat, kissed their two-year-old son goodbye, and has been a missing person ever since. Before disappearing, he texted Talia saying, I love you to the moon and back. He was spotted by CCTV cameras in a local Sainsbury supermarket at 12.19 p.m. after being seen in a boy's department store a short while earlier at around noon. Police received several reports from people who spotted Joshua hitchhiking on the A632 heading towards Chesterfield at around 4 p.m. At the time of his disappearance, he was wearing a pair of blue jeans and a gray super dry coat with light sleeves and a hood that was green on the inside. Other distinguishing features included a Japanese-themed tattoo on his right arm, made up of a koi fish, a dragon, and a crane. On his left wrist, he was tattooed with the words to the moon and back, which wraps around the top in Talia's handwriting. On the inside of the same wrist, he has a tattoo of the moon with the red rocket and rune letters. Police started a search that included assistance from drones, a helicopter, and mountain rescue teams. But despite their best efforts, no trace of Joshua has ever been found. Talia stated that it does not surprise her that he's not been spotted in security footage since the only CCTV cameras in the area are in central Matlock. She says that her biggest concern is the fact that they spoke on numerous occasions about going off-grid and building a treehouse to live in. At the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, Joshua complained about feeling trapped by the lockdown restrictions, and in recent times, he'd been suffering from anxiety, though he refused to see a doctor as he believed it would eventually get better. Talia still firmly believes that Joshua is alive and thinks that he may be living in the woods as he has knowledge of surviving in the wild. The day before his disappearance, his car broke down and the couple worried that the cost to have it put through MOT would have an effect on the Christmas gifts that they could buy for their children. She also stated that their rent was due and that they'd not had a chance to do shopping for Christmas food. In July of 1972, 18-year-old Anita Cunningham and a fellow college student, 19-year-old Robin Hoynville Bartram, set off from Melbourne, Australia, hitchhiking to Queensland, where they planned to visit Robin's mother in her hometown of Bowen. The two women were sharing a flat while studying graphic art in Melbourne, and they were given an extra two weeks of leave to undertake their planned holiday. At first, they considered purchasing plane tickets for their journey, but decided against the wishes of Anita's parents that it would be more adventurous to hitchhike the 1,800 miles to their destination instead. But this decision led to Anita still being a missing person to this day. From the moment that they left their hometown, they were never heard from again. This was not typical behavior for Anita, since her family knew her to always keep in touch as they were very close and a happy family. The women had only a little cash with them, but their families were not concerned as they both had bank accounts that they could fall back on. Neither of their accounts has been accessed since the day of their disappearances. Four months after they left their homes, police made a shocking discovery. Robin was found lifeless under a bridge in Queensland, but Anita was still nowhere to be found and no clues were discovered to explain what may have happened to her. Despite a reward of $25,000 being offered for any information leading to her whereabouts, no one has ever come forward with any information for almost half a century. Police launched an investigation, an inquest, and flooded the media with reports, but to no avail, and no charges have ever been filed. Anne Villiers, who acts on behalf of Anita's family, submitted a 79-page dozier on the case to Australia's premier and police minister, stating that she believes she's found new information that pertains to the two women before they left Melbourne. The dozier includes a list of people who were never questioned by police, and the original police running sheet, which she was able to obtain thanks to the freedom of information laws. Over the years, there have been hundreds of alleged sightings of Anita, but none of them proved fruitful, and her disappearance remains a mystery. Annette Shirley Briffa 
was last seen while she was hitchhiking in Australia on the 10th of January, 1980. 40 years later, she remains a missing person. And despite various clues being found, police have no information on what happened to her. Police received reports that she was seen entering an orange Mazda sedan or a vehicle similar in appearance, heading towards the Sydney suburb of Hornsby. Annette's brother, Raymond, told police that the vehicle she was seen getting into matched that of his uncle, an orange Ford Escort. Not long after her disappearance, the uncle abandoned his car in the remote bushland on the central coast of Australia. It was later discovered that the same uncle had been convicted of a crime some time before, which caused police to consider him a suspect. Annette fought with her possessive and alcoholic father on numerous occasions, and had previously run away from home after their arguments. Raymond further told police that he'd overheard a conversation between his father and uncle, in which they discussed the fact that Uncle John would always find out where Annette was whenever she ran away, and that he would then follow her. 15 years after Annette's disappearance, her uncle informed Raymond that he had something to tell him about her case, and he would return in an hour to talk about it. But Raymond never learned what the information was, as the uncle passed away from a heart attack on the same day before returning home. At an inquest into the case, a man named Raymond Nixon told the court that he was the one who saw Annette entering the orange vehicle after they'd been out drinking and cruising the streets. Nixon has since been jailed for the demise of his wife, though he was never considered a suspect in Annette's case. Serial killer Ivan Millett, who was known to travel between Sydney and the state's north at the same time as Annette's disappearance, could not be ruled out as a suspect, but no evidence has been found that he was involved in any way. Nicole Hoer, a 24-year-old tree planter from Red Deer, Alberta, was working in the Prince George area in Canada in 2002. The last time she was seen was while she was hitchhiking at a gas station on Highway 16 from Prince George to Smithers, where she planned to visit her sister 230 miles away. In 2009, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police searched a two-acre wooded property west of Prince George. The property, which is not far from the gas station where Nicole was last seen, was formerly owned by a man named Leland Vincent Switzer, who was convicted of ending his brother's life two days after Nicole's disappearance. Police considered him a suspect after he told them that he had stopped to relieve himself near the gas station on the same night that Nicole vanished. He told them that he was coming forward in case his DNA was found there. Switzer has long been a person of interest in Nicole's case, but he has stated that he took a polygraph test relating to the disappearance in 2013 and passed. RCMP confirmed this, but never released the results of the polygraph. In 2014, Switzer provided the Parole Board of Canada with a letter stating that he had indeed passed. The Parole Board in turn noted that the letter was not written on an official RCMP letterhead and cannot state without a doubt that it's authentic. Shortly after, the search was extended to include a local dump, which was fine-combed with the use of search dogs and radar equipment. Police hoped that they would find articles relating to the case, such as an abandoned yellow pickup truck that was found in the area. RCMP later released a description of another man who they wanted to question, as they believe he might have information of Nicole's whereabouts on the weekend that she became a missing person. The description was released after they had received over 100 tips from members of the public. In the description, the man is reported to be in his mid-50s, has a pronounced jagged scar on the left side of his neck. He had shoulder-length hair at the time, had a scruffy appearance, and was a smoker. Police have not ruled out the possibility that Nicole may have been the victim of a serial killer, as numerous other people have gone missing or have been found deceased along the same stretch of highway over the past few decades. Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which is based on the best-selling book by Stephen King, follows the tale of Jack Torrance, an aspiring novelist 
who jumps at the chance of becoming the off-season caretaker of the Overlook Hotel in the Colorado Rockies. He intends to spend the harsh winter in the deserted hotel with his wife and young son. But the solitude and lack of alcohol take their toll, and he gradually loses his mind amidst the supernatural forces that occupy the hotel. He is eventually convinced by one of the spirits to end the lives of his family, chasing them out into the snow where they manage to escape and he succumbs to the freezing conditions. But an internet theory has suggested that there is more at play than meets the eye. It suggests that the movie is actually a narrative on the CIA mind control program called MKUltra. The program was developed for the CIA after the organization became concerned that communists had discovered techniques allowing them to use mind control. And so the CIA developed its own program that has been dubbed the most sustained search for techniques of mind control in history. The theory stems from a poster that can be seen in one scene of The Shining. While Jack's son, Danny, is at play in the hotel's playroom, he turns around to see the Grady twins standing behind him. On a wall in the background, a poster of a man on skis with the word Monarch is on display. Theorists claim that Monarch was the code name for MKUltra and that the family had been lured to the hotel as isolated test subjects. As mind control starts to take hold, they begin to hallucinate and all of the paranormal events witnessed by the family are merely in their heads. The theory is bolstered by the fact that when Jack is being interviewed for the job, the hotel's general manager, Stuart Ullman, calls for his assistant, Bill Watson, to join them. It's theorized that Watson is actually the head of the MKUltra program, and he sits in on the interview to assess whether Jack is the subject that they've been looking for. Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction is considered by many to be one of the greatest movies ever made. It's full of humor, violence, great characters, and a gripping storyline. But by far, the most spoken about aspect of the film is a scene that left everyone baffled. Two of the characters, Vincent and Jules, retrieve a briefcase from their boss, Marcellus Wallace. When the briefcase is opened, an orange glow emanates from it, causing odd reactions from those who see what's inside. But viewers never get to see what is revealed, and this has given rise to many fan theories. Some have guessed it may have been something as mundane as gold and diamonds, or maybe jewelry. Others suggest that it was an irradiated isotope, or possibly Elvis's iconic gold suit. But other theories propose that it may contain something more supernatural in nature. One such theory suggests that Marcellus sold his soul to the devil in order to gain power in the criminal underworld, and that it is kept in the briefcase. The code to unlock the briefcase is revealed to be 666, the number of the beast as described in the Bible, and since one scene, shot over Marcellus' shoulder, shows a band-aid on the back of his head, it's suggested that this is where his soul came from. It's also been theorized that the holy mission that Jules undertakes leads him to become a shepherd for the righteous man. Mario, the chubby plumber from the massively popular Nintendo game franchise, has appeared in over 200 video games since he was created by Shigeru Miyamoto in 1983. Together with his brother Luigi, he is on a seemingly never-ending quest to save Princess Peach from the game's antagonist, Bowser, a tortoise-like, fire-breathing creature featuring elements of a dragon and an ox. When Super Mario Galaxy 2 was released in 2010, its graphics and gameplay were praised for being near-perfect, and upon release, the game met critical acclaim, with some critics hailing it as the greatest game ever developed. During Mario's adventure, he once again attempts to rescue Princess Peach while searching for and collecting 242 Power Stars along the way. The princess has been kidnapped by Bowser and taken to the center of the universe where she awaits her rescuer. 
Throughout his quest, Mario travels to various galaxies in search for the princess. And during one of the transitions where he's catapulted through space, an eagle-eyed gamer spotted something strange that has sparked a dark and twisted internet theory. If Mario's point of view is shifted at just the right moment during the transition, a few dark, mysterious figures can be seen on the horizon, seemingly peering down ominously at the traveler whizzing by. The area containing the strange figures is not accessible in the game, and there's no way to get closer to them even with the use of hacks. Most people didn't even notice that they were there, and others assumed that they were trees growing on the horizon. But a closer look reveals that they have eyes and long arms, giving rise to the question of what their purpose is. One gamer who had a closer look at the game's data discovered that the sky texture for that particular level is named Beyond Hell Valley Sky. And since there's no level called Hell Valley, a theory arose. Since the game is set in space, it's been suggested that the figures are actually native aliens who are powerless witnesses to the destruction of their planet caused by Mario. That 70s show was a sitcom released in 1998 and follows the lives of six friends from 1976 to 1979. Much of the show takes place in the renovated basement of the house owned by the Foreman family of which Eric is the only son. At one point in the show, one of the friends, Hyde, is invited to move in with the foremans in order to give him a more stable home life. Eric also dates his next door neighbor, Donna, and the group of friends spend their time getting into trouble, going to school, and working on their romantic relationships. At the end of the seventh season, however, Eric decides to move to Africa in order to teach meaning that he would not appear in the show as he did before, until the very last minute of the show's last episode. This decision was made by Topher Grace, the actor who portrayed Eric Foreman, after the show's schedule didn't allow for him to pursue other acting opportunities. Though the show carried on without him, making reference to his character at least once during each episode, his omission from the cast left many fans wondering whether there was another reason for his departure birthing a slew of fan theories. One theory suggests that it is all explained during the fourth season when a tornado approaches the town. On the same night, the school's snow prom is scheduled and the whole group plans to attend. Eric realizes that he forgot to fetch Donna from her job at the local radio station and sets out to pick her up, oblivious to the tornado warning that has been issued. As he drives to the radio station, the tornado can be seen in his Vista cruiser. Back at the house, Eric's parents learn that the warning has been lifted and an announcer states that a local teen is in critical condition. The theory suggests that the teen is, in fact, Eric. His friends who are attending prom would be oblivious to the fact that he was out in the storm until it passes, and since Donna is still at work, she assumes he didn't survive due to the terrible weather. And so Eric lies in the hospital in a coma after the storm, accounting for his absence from the rest of the show. The rest of the episodes are created by his brain attempting to fill in the blanks and unresolved issues that were present at the time. The new developments in his neighborhood are created in his mind by his friends and family talking to him at his bedside. In the last season, Eric's brain does a test to see what everyone's lives would be like without him. He realizes they would ultimately be fine and he passes away. His return in the last episode is said to be his mind's way of bidding farewell to his loved ones. My Neighbor Totoro is a Japanese animated fantasy movie from Studio Ghibli released in 1988. The plot revolves around a professor's two daughters, who are named Satsuki and Mei, during the 1950s when the family moves into an old house in order to be closer to the hospital where their mother is recovering from an illness. They soon discover that the house is occupied by tiny house spirits called Susuwatari that are seen by the characters when they move from dark areas into lighter ones. The two girls befriend a larger spirit called Totoro in the hollow of a camphor tree, 
and when they learn that a visit from their mother is delayed due to a setback in her treatment, they argue with each other and May leaves the house to take fresh corn to her mother. Presuming her as missing, Satsuki starts a search and eventually asks Totoro for help, who then carries her to May, reuniting them for good. They then learn that their mother is doing well and she eventually returns home. But a fan theory suggests a different narrative based on the Sayama incident in which a girl went missing in the town of Sayama in May of 1963. A ransom note was later sent which demanded 200,000 yen for her return. Police decided to use fake money and sent her sister to the rendezvous point, but the kidnapper became suspicious and fled the scene. The kidnapper ultimately took his victim's life, causing her sister to end her own life. And so many parallels can be drawn between this incident and the animated film. In the movie, both sisters' names refer to the month of May, which is when the Sayama incident took place. Satsuki is the traditional Japanese name for the month of May, while the second sister, May's name, is a little more obvious in comparison. Furthermore, in one scene, a box of tea can be seen in the background with the Japanese writing on the side that translates to Sayama, the area in which the incident took place. Next comes the part of the film when Mei goes missing after leaving the family's house. She's seen crying at the foot of six Jizo statues, which are considered to be the protectors of those who pass away at a young age. When Satsuki asks Totoro to help her find her sister, She's transported on a cat bus which has the words Grave Road written on it, suggesting that they're traveling to the afterlife. When the sisters eventually return home, they appear to have no shadows, suggesting that they've passed away and become spirits, with one following the other out of grief. The theory, therefore, suggests that the Susuwatari are in fact just symbolism for the afterlife, where the two sisters now reside. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.